Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Blythe Academy Back to School Assembly. I just, I felt like a principal saying that. <laughs> but I feel really good. So my name is Jillian Danford, and I'm a regular panelist on CTV's Mind the Gap. And I also am the star of my own show called Auntie Jillian on CTV, and I will be your moderator for tonight. And as you all know, we are in the middle of a pandemic and getting our kids back to school is a national priority. And we have some amazing women here tonight that are on our panel to help start the conversation and to give us some insight on how are we gonna get our kids back to school? So I'm gonna give you the great opportunity to meet our panelists. So let's start with Alison. Oh, hi. Well, first of all, thank you, Blythe Academy, for doing this. Um, I'm a parent educator and a family counselor. And as you can imagine, working with families, I really know just how stressful this whole trying to combine a pandemic with an education has been for families. And the fact that you're uh, uh, gathering up this great group of experts and letting us have a dialogue and answer questions is, is a tremendous community service. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I have three parenting books and I also host the parenting show on, on uh, Rogers TV and do regular media work as well as I was telling the ladies before we went live. Um, I speak around the globe and um, it's been really wonderful to connect with some of the other countries to ask how they're doing. I couldn't be a prouder Canadian right now um, in terms of the response and, and how we're doing here in Canada compared to some of my friends in you know, Bulgaria and Uruguay and things. So um, anyways, it's a pleasure and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. That's Alison Schaefer, by the way. And next we have Kathy. And Kathy, tell everyone who you are. And I'm so happy that you were able to sponsor this great event. Well, thanks, Jillian, and thanks, ladies, for joining me tonight because uh, we, could, we can't do it alone, right? We need our community partners to, to talk about this important topic. Jillian, you said you feel like a principal. Well, actually, I am a principal, or at least a retired principal. I was principal in Waterloo Region for a long career, 33 and a half years. I, I was an educator there, did my first retirement, and I um, moved over to Blythe. So now I'm chief academic officer for Blythe, uh, which means that I'm working with all of our principals on our back to school plans at our various schools. So this is a really important topic for us. It is, but Kathy, I heard that you're also a genius in math and computer science. So I am glad they're not uh, <laughs> moderating that tonight. <laughs> and next on our panel is Lauren Barr. Lauren, tell everyone who you are. Hi everyone, so my name is Lauren. I am an educator at Western in London. Um, I teach sociology, specifically education. Um, and I spend a lot of time on a regular outside of pandemic time um, critiquing or thinking about how we could do education in different ways, looking at some of our strengths and some of our challenges. So I hope to bring some of that to our conversation today. I'm also a mom. I have two boys who are both in elementary school. So this is definitely, you know, a real life experience for me as well. Wonderful. Now, I just want the viewers to know that you can participate in this conversation by way of your questions and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. So, okay, let's start off with hopes and aspirations because I'm gonna tell you, this pandes pandemic is messing with our next generation and generations to come. And I have a fear as to the number of cases is it low enough for the schools to be reopening? And what about myself being a parent of two young adults? My daughter's in university and I still have concerns because I'm not sure that she's really one of those that can actually be outside of the classroom while her professor is giving lectures. So I'm curious to see how other children are gonna navigate their way through all of this. And I wanna pose a question first to Allison. What do you hope to see for back to school this year? Well, I love that we're starting with, with hope and aspirations. Let's, let's start. I mean, I am a born optimist. Yes. Um, and, and maybe that's a good thing because I work in a business where, you know, I need some self-care because I hear a lot of tragedy and, and anxieties every day. Um, but I would say one of the big hopes that I have is that we uh, learn to be, or, or maybe not learn, that we work a little harder to understand how important it is 
for us to have a sense of compassion for the challenges that the world is facing, that when we look at the countries that are mounting some of the most effective responses, it's coming from them collaborating at all levels. So I think most of us grew up with the idea of like home and school. That's almost like one word. Home and school should work together and put the child's educational interests first. So it's sort of the same thing. If we can if we can get the government to coordinate and work with the unions and work with the families and, and work with the economy and if everyone could understand that it's a massive puzzle we have to put back together and the best way that we can expedite that is by seeing each other as collaborators and and being more uh, having a sense of uh, faith and and know that kids are incredibly resilient um, rather than the sort of fear and scarcity like someone's going to get ahead and Mike is going to fall behind and um, you know I, I think that's um, if we can try to stay positive and, and collaborative we will we will tweak and adjust and we will usher this generation through I, I really believe that. Anyone else want to speak on that? Well, I'm just going to jump in. I think one of the things that we've seen during this pandemic is that people have begun to realize the real value of education, the value of teachers, um, the importance of school in our children's lives. And so as a, as a longtime educator, that's really important for me because it, it, I believe strongly in education. It is what, what our kids need. They need that routine. They need that collaboration. They need that socialization. So in some ways, this has been really positive for education. It's also asking us to be creative or forcing us to be creative. So no longer can we just do what we've always done. We need to think outside the box. Lauren, you've probably got some, some ideas about this, yep. but what does education look like? What does, what does good education for all of our kids look like in this new world? I'm interested to hear your thoughts, Lauren. You've stolen my, you stolen my spiel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, widow, widow. <laughs> it's a good thing. It means we're on the same wavelength. I, I, I find a conversation I've been having a lot, both with students, parents, and educators is kind of, well, how do we know that we're going to recreate it the way that it was before? And I keep kind of pushing back going, why do we assume the way that it was before is the best way? Um, you know, there's a lot of really uh, interesting ways that we can educate that we maybe don't do because it's it's easy not to or there's a lot of challenges and boundaries and barriers that make it challenge like harder and so those have all kind of blown up <laughs> um, and so now we have the opportunity to kind of go beyond the walls beyond the boundaries you know all of those types of metaphors you want to create um, as a sociologist I've also seen a lot of you know recognition of inequality or conversations around equity or things like that and it's not as though those things weren't there before but this pandemic has kind of thrown them into our face so it's a really good opportunity to stop and think about you know what does that look like and how could we not move forward the same way that we were that we were exactly and you know there's been a lot of talk um surrounding guilt from parents and putting kids in school versus parents working from home. How do you feel about that? How do you women feel about that? Because I feel, and speaking to, my kids are, are self-sufficient, they're older, but as I'm speaking to my sister-in-law, she is really grappling of sending her kid back to school or should she retire earlier? So, I mean, because she's feeling guilty. So what are your thoughts on that? So I'm going to jump in because I asked, it's interesting enough, I have a 27-year-old daughter and I asked my daughter that question today. I don't know why, but I did. And I loved her response. And it was that every parent needs to feel empowered to make a decision that's right for their family without feeling guilt. Because I, I think there's no, one right, there's no one right answer now that works for everyone. Um, people are all in different spots. Kids are in different spots. Families are in different spots. They need to be able to do what works for them individually, I think. I agree. Anyone else? Well, yes, I think, and to your, to your point about um, the fact that we're, we're really shaking the foundations of some institutions, and really when we talk about guilt, from a psychological perspective, it's, it's sort of like our little alarm bell that we're not doing the prescribed societal um, instruction code set that we're supposed to. And we have to remind ourselves, the code book just got thrown out. And, and again, yay. 
uh, <laughs> because there's, there was many things that weren't working in that old code book, as, as, as you say. So if we can, again, be compassionate with ourselves and say, what, are, what was involved in this decision making um, that I would know that this would be a right decision for my family? And that might be perceived threat. That could be pre-existing condition. Uh, that could be, um, I'm not coping well, I'm falling into a depression and my husband is starting to get drinking and violent with the children, or we can't afford to lose our house because I can't go to work and I can't work with a, a, a kid who has this many demands on me. There's, if, there's so many different situations to look at. Um, and the idea then that isn't before in history we wouldn't have had this many resources now we're saying okay look at you can do hybrid you can do online you can do it at home you can we're, we're trying so hard to be to be accommodating and i think that's fantastic because i think every child should be looked at in their unique situation um that, that's why i always loved ieps parents used to think oh i don't know if i want my kid you know is it a stigma to be on an individual learning plan i'm like every kid should be on an individual learning plan every kid should be on their growing edge in each of their strengths so so now we're kind of customizing what does work home school child care what does that look like for my family and where can i get it and suddenly boom, all these resources are coming out of the woods because everybody is trying to to help families, either nonprofits or for-profit business. Like everyone is, is trying to be helpful here and we have got lots of options. So, um, so, so I think we drop the guilt, make the, have confidence that you're making a good decision and let's not judge other people for the, the things that went into their equation. Right, definitely no judging because I mean, each family is gonna have struggles upon struggles, even after COVID. And mm -hmm. some are gonna really like what they're seeing they're going to maybe not want to send their kids back into a traditional class full of 25 and 30 kids. They might make other um, arrangements, such as with Blythe and their class, their class population is really small. So um, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Lauren? Um, no, I was thinking along the same lines of Allison. I, for me, guilt is socially created, right? You feel it internally, but it's social. So I've been uplifted, I guess, to look at my circles, and it could just be because of who I surround myself with. But when I see people going, you know, I'm sending my kids, but this person's doing remote, and this person's decided to homeschool, and that's okay. That's the decision that's right for me, and it's going to, and if I have to adjust, I adjust. So right. I think maybe we need to let go. There's no perfect answer right now. There is and the, I love that the creativity that is happening is amazing. I was just reading about university students because they're doing everything online. They've decided why pay for housing there. And so they're going in on an RV and they're up in the mountains and it's all these law students that are, you know, and this other family, they got the kids in the community and they cleared out their barn and they now have the parents are now working and rotating amongst this. We, we, we never would have had this the options we would have, you know you would have gone to the school at the end of the road your biggest decision you know probably you know, are you going to go catholic or public or you know private we didn't have we have so many options now people are figuring this out um, and I, I have just one more thing just for parents if you have not had an opportunity to watch the very popular ted talk by sir kenneth robinson that talks about the history of how this version of education got created and how outdated it is and how underservicing it is for our bright-minded children. Um, you know, I always thought it, what, that education needed more than a renovation. It, it needed, uh, you know, a complete Risk. renovation. Yeah, yeah, it's a knockdown start from scratch. And, and this has forced our hand on that. And so, uh, and so I, again, that's me as the optimist, but I, I will we'll service our kids. I really think we will. I'm with you there. And I wanna talk about the new normal. What is the school board plan for going back to school? For me, it's questionable. How many children they allow in one class? And will there be a physical distancing? And what will that look like throughout the school day? Not even in the class, throughout the school day with recess. How about the desk? Are they going to stagger the desk? And how do you ensure that the kids will wear masks? So I'm also concerned about the teachers and they have, how about if when they're sick and they have to stay at home? What are the strategies that are in place to support remote work so students won't fall behind? So, Kathy, so, take a stab at this one. Big questions, Jillian, big questions. And, and, and as you know, we're a small private school. We're not a school board. School, the school board is my background, though. Um, it's a tough world. I, I think it's a really tough, a tough goal for school boards 
big schools, big classes. Um, they are doing their best. Uh, I would say they are doing their best in a, in a really difficult circumstance. Uh, one, of our, one of our big advantages at Blythe is because our schools are small, so already fewer contacts. Because our classes are small, average class sizes of 10 or less, uh, that allows us to cohort the kids more easily. It allows us to physically distance them more easily. Um, but it's still, I mean, we're still grappling with all of those very same, those very same issues at Blythe. How, how do we keep kids safe? Because while I think it's really important that kids go back to school, as, as we've talked about, I think they need that socialization, that connection. Uh, we need to be able to do it in a safe way. So school boards are grappling with that. We're grappling with that at Blythe as well. It's part of why, I'm going to go back up a little bit to our last question. Uh, parents have more choices than they've ever had. And I don't think they need to think that the first choice they make is necessarily the last choice they make. There's flexibility for kids, right? At Blythe, we've, we've introduced a new program called Orbit. So it's a new campus. It's, it's totally virtual, face-to-face, uh, -face, synchronous learning. So it's just like this for kids um, in classes every day, regular time, um, learning virtually. Uh, that's maybe right for kids who have pre-existing conditions or kids who are frightened or parents who are a little bit nervous. Um, then we have our regular face-to-face, -face, as our school boards do, face-to-face uh, -face instruction in the classrooms. That's right for another group of people. Or transitioning back and forth between the virtual world, the face-to-face -face world. That's, that, that's an opportunity for people as well. So lots of different options out there for kids. Um, but I think parents, it's good for parents to know educators are spending a lot of time, a lot of time thinking about how do we do this safely and as well as we possibly can for, for our students. Right. And how do we consider children's different learning styles in this new normal? What do you think about that, Lauren? I think when I think about things like differentiated learning or um, personalized learning, it always involved a variety of, of ways of teaching. That's the whole point of it. Um, the technology we have today is phenomenal. And every plan I've seen, whether it's private or public, they are trying to do a flexible, um, a flexible and kind of personalized learning. So in my mind, we're almost, we're moving in a direction I would love to see all education go. Um, I think, you know, if you've got opportunities knowing that people might not always have access to the internet at the moment that you're going to be there. And then someone else needs that face to face because they want to see what you're, they need to see your lips or they need to see your facial expressions to understand what you're saying. Um, so if you offer the material in a lot of different ways, they can go through it at their own pace. They can interact with it the way that it works best for them. I'm, I'm, I guess, lucky because I teach social sciences. I think something like chemistry would be a little more challenging perhaps, um, but I think we're in a good time period where there's a lot of great devices out there and things for people to use. Um, and, and I'm gonna jump in ahead of Allison because I know we wanna hear Allison's. One of the things that we saw on the whole differentiated learning piece in our virtual classrooms is sometimes students who struggled the most in the regular classroom were successful in the virtual environment. Um, shy kids who were nervous about speaking up in front of their peers somehow felt safer behind a, a computer screen. Seems a bit counterintuitive to somebody my age, but um, we, we found that it worked really well for a lot of students. So. Yes, this whole new style of education seems to be working well for, for, for various types of kids with different learning styles. Yeah, I was just, that, that for sure has come up with uh, some of the clients that I have that have uh, attention deficit disorder that mm -hmm. actually have a very hard time with focus in the classroom. Yes. Um, kids that are still um, probably smart kids, but uh, if you do not feel your sense of belonging and connection in the classroom, you, you will end up being the class clown. You will, you will disturb your neighbors because yes, you want to learn, but you're, you still don't feel your psychological sense of security that you've got your friends in your class. And, um, and so you get a lot of misbehavior and a lot of disturbance. And uh, in fact, uh, some research shows that teachers spend as much as 80% of their time correcting those types of behaviors that interfere with the ability to deliver the curriculum. And so those kids at home, they, they can find their other ways to socialize and get out to, you know, uh, whatever the allowable extracurriculars are. But when it comes down time to focus because we need to learn this math concept, they're better able to do it. I'm not saying 
every kid is like that. Some, I also work with some other kids that are incredibly social and they can only learn in a group. And of course, there's ways that we have technology that allows you to put kids into chat groups and work collaboratively on something. You don't have to be in the same room, but they're still getting the same social piece. So again, I think we actually have more opportunities to find the fit between each individual child um, and, and, and you don't need to commit to anything for even a whole year. There's some of these places are saying, well, you know, start now and if you don't like it, you can come back. And in fact, I think every parent should think about that, that we probably will have somebody who develops a symptom or maybe um, whatever that they're going to say people need to quarantine for two weeks or, and then they're going to have to go home or they're going to have to go somewhere out. So we're, we're going to have to have a plan B you know, to have a plan B. It's it's gonna it's gonna be I think back and forth and here and there and augmented and oh of course because we've never been in this situation before so it's gonna be a lot of trial and error. Yeah, well, and absolutely we will have plan Bs. I mean, public boards do. We do it live. Uh, one of the one of the advantages we've got this September is that we did this back in March, right? We were in our classrooms. We pivoted out. We, we worked hard with our kids. We tri with trial and error, lots of trial and error, what works. And so we've got that pan plan B in our back pocket this September if we need to pivot out again. Fingers crossed we don't, but we are going to have cases. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Yeah. And so we're, we're ready. I think schools are ready to, to deal with those circumstances. And, and with the new normal, what do you think the long-term effects will be for the school system? Wow. Oh, I want Lauren to go first on this one. <laughs> do I, do I get to <laughs> Lauren does a lot of research and think so. It's a lot of pressure. Okay. Um, <laughs> the new normal, I, I'm going to go with my positive optimistic side. I'm, I'm really hoping that we're going to take this chance. Like when I hear you guys talking, I hear a lot of, we're checking in with the students. We're asking them how it's going. We're, we're checking in with parents, asking them how it's going. That's something I would love to see become the new normal, right? Where it's, it's not, this is what school looks like, do it. It's, it's more, is this working for you? Can we adjust it? How does it need to, you know, what's happening now? The same student from a six month period can need something totally different depending on what's going on in their life. So I love seeing that. I know there's concerns, it's a weird, it's a weird point in history with as a sociologist because I can usually kind of look ahead and go, okay, the economy is probably going to do this and the, you know, healthcare is going <laughs> to, um, I'm, I'm finding that one a little more hard because I, I don't know how long this is going to be. Is this six months? Is this a year, two years? I, I'm not really sure. Um, I do think I would like to see schools and educators in general, helping students focus on skills. That's something that I'm always advocating is more of a skills-based approach. So what do you do well? Um, what, you know, we all have challenges, you know, let's work on those. But if you focus on the positive, students tend to do better because they feel good. And then they're willing to work on those harder things that don't come as naturally to them. So I'd love to see that. Um, I look a lot at what are the employers looking for? And so I would love to see the skills that employers are looking for built more into schools as well. So um, we talk a lot, for example, about critical thinking. But when I look at what colleagues are doing, we're not actually giving students a lot of chance to practice that. The one thing that they look, the number one thing they're looking for are active listeners. And there's a lot of ways of actively listening. And that can be online in a Zoom chat or that can be through writing. So I think changing how we focus education so it's less curriculum driven and more student centered would be where I would want things to go. I want to remind the audience that bring in your questions. Let's <laughs> put the ladies to test. Come on, audience. <laughs> so, okay, I want to talk about coping with back to school in some children because I know there are children with a lot of anxiety and they're going to have a hard time coping, especially since they've been home with their parents. So going back into the classroom is going to be a little bit of a task for them. So some children, they may not have the great experience that some had in the spring with the online classes when they started. So they're turned off already. So 
it seemed to me that the spring classes might have been an emergency pivot for some students. So I want to ask, how do we help support our children with COVID-related back-to-school stress? This is probably a, another one for the sociologist, but anyone can go first. Um, I know, for example, research shows us that there is what we call the summer slide. Uh, so there's certain families, certain types of students who are more likely to be at a disadvantage going back in September. I don't know what that's going to look like in this year or in the future because it usually is, is connected to um, camps or learning opportunities that students have had throughout the summer that other ones maybe didn't get and so they come in already used to routine and used to learning and those types of things. Um, everything was canceled this year. <laughs> so, so you may not see that, although I'm sure there were a lot of parents doing online learning or, you know, purchasing pools. It seemed to be a big thing this year. Um, so it could be that kind of thing. Um, every student's different, right? My kids get really anxious going back to school. They're not going back to school this year. I chose to keep them home because I have that privilege to be able to do that. Um, and they're normally anxious. So they would be more anxious if they were going back than normal because they've been the longest March break in history. Uh, <laughs> so checking in with them, um, preparing them for the classroom, getting them used to wearing masks, uh, giving them a sense of what the day is going to look like, those types of things I think as a parent is what I would be doing. I read an interesting article designed for parents the other day about it just helping them. What, what should you be thinking about with your students or your children? And it talked about four areas, sleep, because kids' sleep patterns are, are likely um, way off right now. And so starting to get your kids back into some sort of a regular sleeping habit, uh, diet, uh, I mean, we've all, we all started out really strong, I think, early in the pandemic, but we've let that slide a little bit lately as well. Academics and, and socializing. Some kids um, are, are probably really excited to go back and socializing, but for, or to socialize, but for other kids, that's hard because not every student is, is really happy or part of a peer group or, or has a, a positive life at school. So those, are the, those were the four areas that were identified as places to prepare your kids, to talk to your kids about what, what the new normal might look like. And I also would add to that, that some parents have really um, kept their kids quite sheltered. Yes. And so even though things have opened up, not every parent has given their kids exposure to like the things that we've done, like going to the grocery store or going to the bank or whatever. We've been out more than our kids have. And I, I think you need to start going out for ice cream so yeah. that you, you, you get accustomed to seeing other people with masks and having regular interactions and just that exposure that, yeah, you know what, this actually is, okay. you know, I can be safe and it can feel normal. Yeah. Um, so I, I would definitely um, encourage that piece as well and yeah definitely the sleep and especially if you've got teenagers they basically became nocturnal animals which you know they're <laughs> uh, as their way of finding privacy um and really the sleep cycle you can really only kind of play with it by about 15 minutes a night so uh, uh, the teens that i'm talking to on a regular basis they're staying up till four in the morning that's oh, yeah. their, that is it's going to take a lot of 15 minute increments to get them ready, <laughs> ready up and, to be up and at it so we might want to start that now yeah that's true you know i asked some little ones grade threes i asked my little nephew and i asked him what are you most concerned about in going back to school and he said he doesn't want to wear his mask all day it's gonna be hard what are we gonna do these kids are going to be taking off their mask. Yeah, well, I think for sure parents need to experiment with different models. And we've probably all had this ourselves. Like I have some I just cannot breathe through. The, fa the fabric is too thick. Um, you know, so I think finding, finding one that your child likes, and of course with the little kids, but, you know, anything that's got a dinosaur or one of their favorite heroes on it or whatever. But they're coming up with some pretty creative ideas. I've seen headbands that have buttons so that it doesn't have to go around your ears and pull on your ears. Um, I've seen ones that have like a little bit more structure so it holds it away from the face so you don't get that sort of psychological feeling of, of uh, not being able to breathe even though you can. So I think that, that we really need to have 
really mastered the art of what mask is your kid going to be okay with. And I had a little parent hack here. Um, I had one mom who said to her child that they could have more time on their iPad gaming if they agreed to wear the mask every time. <laughs> every time. So it's like, you want to binge watch Grey's Anatomy, you got to put the mask on. So that wasn't endorsed by Allison Schaefer. I am just saying that the, there are people, yeah, I mean, we, we do have to start getting yeah. ourselves ready for those, lo those, longer, those longer spells of time. And I also think that once the kids are in there, I think it's, it's, part of it is the comfort. Part of it, I think, is that at a certain age, kids just think, am I going to look I, like I have to fit in with my peers? And this oh. is, like, yeah. And I think when they get there and they realize, yeah, but everybody is wearing one. Like, so I, I think that will settle down. It's like maybe like the first time you had to wear like a uniform to a private school or something. And you're like, I've never looked like this before. I look like a little businessman. And then when you get there and everyone's like, oh yeah, I, I'm like everyone else. It's okay. It is. Kids are adaptable and they're resilient. I've been following some blogs of American schools that have gone back. They have other problems because their caseload in the communities are much, much worse than ours. But generally the principals are reporting that the kids, kids adapt, kids, they, they expected kids not to wear masks, they expected them to struggle and they generally have not. They've been very compliant and uh, they wanna be there. They're happy to be at school. They're happy to be with their right. friends. So they do what they need to do. Right, and so ladies, should parents be worried about education gaps between children who choose to learn at home versus those in class learning? I'm going to go back to that guilt question, if I could. I think parents have to focus on doing what's right for their kids. And, and I think right now, um, the actual education learning is not the most important piece. I think getting kids back into a sense of normal, I think mental health. We haven't talked about kids' mental health yet. Um, but I think that those are all things that, for me at least, even though I'm an educator and I believe fundamentally in education, I think those other issues are top of mind. And again, I'd be interested to hear what Allison and, and Lauren have to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I, so I helped open a couple of preschools here um, that go up to kindergarten and we, we sort of talked to the parents about, we call it our ABCs. When we do our ABCs at that age, it was acceptance, belonging, which is that community piece, and then you can do curriculum. Yeah. I, I do believe that an engaged child that is um, uh, settled psychologically and, you know, as, and as social beings, feeling a sense of connection in our family, feeling a sense of connection in our peer group, in our classroom, in our school, in our communities. That's what kind of allows us to feel settled so that we can have the bandwidth to then engage and want to grow. I mean, that's the brain. The human brain really is designed with two specific tasks to be social and to learn. That's we're kind of, So I, I, I'm like, try to stop a child from learning. Like we're, we're, we're learning all the time. So again, if we can if stop having the fear, that there, there's this fear that we're not doing our part as a parent to help educate our kid. If we can take the long road, if we can take the big, you know, the, the longer path view that, you know what, by the time their education journey is over, and I hope frankly that it never is, I hope we're all lifelong learners, right. um, that they will find their way to, to, to learn, to master subject matter and find what engages them and then use that as some occupation or vocation or mission to give back to the community. So I think if we just sort of stay a little philosophical, um, then, then we can move away from someone got ahead and we're falling behind and, and you know, my kid's not going to have a place in the job market if they didn't have straight A's when they were in grade seven, you know? Schools also know, right? Teachers know. Teachers know that kids are not all coming in in the same place. They're well aware of the fact that kids are going to be at different stages, different levels, and they're prepared for that. So, I mean, we've been talking about that really regularly. All, all spring and all summer. What, how, how do we make this an experience that takes kids where they are and, and brings them all forward? And I, I think every school in the province is doing that. Great. Well, we have an audience question from Rebecca and she wants to know, what do you recommend for a child who gets better grades online but prefers in class, but grades not as high and is now entering grade 11? That's a great question, Rebecca. So I'll take a crack at that. Okay. Um, so, so again, there, if you can augment, you don't, you, so he can enroll, go, go to the school where his friends are, um, go where he's socially connected and thriving that way. But then the world is full of resources that you can supplement with so that if he's working on science, for example, I'll just give you one example for science, 
you know, go to one of the free Apple's Got resources. There's other, there's other curriculum things that you can plug in to put your marks up where you want it to be. So you got, you got to be a little bit more creative yourself in finding resources. Um, but I, I don't think it necessarily has to be an, an either or situation. No, when, what I was going to say was in terms of grade 11, nice piece about that is grade 11, it's all on a course by course basis. So maybe the, maybe the student can take some courses in school with his friends where that social connection is really important, but they can do other courses online where marks matter more. Um, so it, it, it would be a great opportunity for a hybrid model, I think. I was going to say too, I would look at what it is about the online learning that is working well for them and then see if that can be brought into the classroom. Like there's gotta be something about the way that it's set up, whether it's the distraction piece or whether it's more that it's linear and it's offered in different ways. So if you can find, find out what it is about the online domain that's working well and see if that can be brought into the classroom if that's where he prefers to be. I just find that it's amazing and fantastic that they have the choice. Back in my time, it was you're going to school. There's no such thing as online or we weren't homeschooling. So fantastic. See, the pandemic really brought us into resetting what we really needed to reset our education system. And Rebecca has... And to Lauren's point, let's be specific about, you know, what is the unique struggle of this child in this subject matter and addressing that as opposed to really not being child-centered and just saying, well, this, this kid is struggling, their marks go down, you know, um, no one, no one tried to make accommodations right. for the, for, for the standard student. You, you had to like meet a criteria to get, you know, ex, you know, to, to say, I need to write a test in a room on my own. And you know, you had to meet criteria to, to basically say I'm not functioning and then kids get labeled and they think they're stupid or they think they've um, you know it was a kind of shameful to need help and now we're like no you know what if you're better at oral you'll do oral if you're better at written let's do, give you more in written and we can nice. we can be way more um, you know using Gardner's learning styles and, and work more collaboratively to make everybody shine the best they can yeah. yes so there's a question from David and he wants to know, what are your thoughts on hybrid classes to help cutting down class sizes? So I've got thoughts on hybrid classes and I, I think they're, I mean, yeah, they, they, they will cut down class sizes for sure because if some kids choose hybrid and some ch kids choose um, in-class learning, but I think that the real advantage of, of hybrid classes are not so much the reduction in class sizes, they are just in providing choice for kids. Uh, choice for families and the opportunities for families and students to go back and forth between the different different learning models. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts on that? If we don't, we're going to move on because we look like we have a university student, Bradley Robinson. Hi, Kathy. He said, <laughs> shout out from Blythe Waterloo. <laughs> Up until yesterday, I was extremely worried to go back to school. And then the staff had a really candid conversation with our amazing principal. I now feel much confident in attending in-person classes. If you were to give teachers at Blythe three pieces of advice going back into the classroom after being out for so long, what would those three pieces of advice be? Okay. Well, shouldn't. Shout out to Blythe Academy Waterloo. Wow. Yay. Actually, Brad Robinson or Bradley Robinson is one of our teachers in Waterloo and he was not a plant. We didn't tell him to give this question. So oh, I just, yeah. I just, full disclosure there. Uh, Brad, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really glad, Brad, that you had a good conversation with Lori. Lori Guest is our amazing principal in Waterloo and she is an amazing principal, does a fabulous job. The whole staff does. And they do in all of our campuses. I, I mean that quite sincerely. What are my three pieces of advice? I think my three, three, three pieces of advice are one, um, don't be afraid. It's not going to be as bad as you think. Um, kids are resilient, staff are resilient, our schools are, are prepared. So don't be afraid, it's, it's going to go, it's going to be okay. Um, I think the second piece of advice I would give is don't focus entirely on the academics, focus on the kids, how are they feeling? What are the struggles that they're bringing to the classroom? What are the fears they're bringing to the classroom? Think about where your students are and try to work with those kids. And then my third piece of advice is once you settle, once you settle that piece down, then it's time to start to work on academics. And again, as we discussed a moment ago, be really aware that some of those kids 
got the full curriculum last year. Some of those kids did not. So they're going to be at all different places, not just emotionally as my second piece of advice, but also academically, my third piece of advice. So be prepared to deal with that in your classrooms as well. Very nice. And now speaking about teachers, there are a lot of teachers that are nervous to go back to the school. Yes, just like the kids are. What are we going to do? What are we going to do with the teachers? What are we going to tell them? How is this going to impact them? What happens if they get ill? Yeah, it's Lots of questions. Lots of questions for teachers. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a difficult time. I, I think what they need to hold on to is just how important they are in this world to the kids in their classrooms, um, how important they are to our education system. And maybe hold on to the fact that teachers haven't always felt as valued as maybe they should have been in, in our world. And this is a good opportunity for all of us to recognize just how very important teachers are to our, our students, our, our society, um, and just generally. So hold on to that and communicate, communicate, communicate. Share your, share your concerns with your principal. Uh, share your concerns with one another. Talk it out. Um, administrators want to help. They want to hear teachers' concerns. They want to do what they can to address those concerns. So don't be afraid to, to talk, to, to share, to share your thinking. I also think uh, in working with teachers, people that tend to go into education and want to work in the classroom, they, they are, have a real commitment to those kids. Yes. And they have such a strong sense of responsibility that, um, that I think it's that extra burden of this, the, the more responsibility. And I think they also need to hear it's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, um, that they're not, they're not alone and, um, and that we will also support. So like, just, just like in the beginning when we, you know, do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, it was always like, thank you for working. Thank you for working. I was just, <laughs> I just want to tell teachers, thank you. Thank you for working. And, and, and I have personally met and done work with our chief public health officer, Dr. Tam, um, around, um, uh, prior to the, uh, the, the virus. Um, but she was also responsible for, um, uh, vaccination information. And so, so I, I know how bright she is. Um, I, I've watched that office work and we would not be saying yes. We would, if we would not be putting people um, into this situation, if our public health officers saw, thought that it was not a good health decision to make. And so we have to have some, some trust there that this has been looked at and thought of and uh, and to your point just keep communicating if anything seems amiss you know we'll we'll, we'll address it and, and i like your comment trust i mean trust that the public health system has said it, it, it's good it's time to go back trust that schools are, are doing everything they can to make it safe they're following the guidelines they're following the directions and actually that's the message for parents as well trust trust that uh, the public health officials have made a good solid decision and that schools are working hard to make it as safe as it possibly can be. Right. We're, you know, we're always making a decision that is about mitigating risk and, and assessing it against benefit. And every single time we put our kid on a school bus, yeah. in our car to drive them to school, on an airplane, we're, we're you know, are we going to stay locked in home? No, we want to go somewhere. We're going to get in a car. There's a risk associated with that. But what do we do? We buckle up. We put in airbags. We put them in safety approved child seats. We, we take precautions. So this is just, it's a new risk. So it seems scary to us, but we're going to put on masks and we're going to wear gloves and we're going to sanitize our hands and we're going to stay apart and we'll find new ways to, to, to play. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I really think it's just this adjustment period. Um, but I, I do think that kids... Kids are resilient, adults are resilient. I think, I think we will adjust and get through this. All right, well, ladies, I am seeing that the time is near to ending this wonderful conversation, but I have one last question. Can all of you share your final thoughts and your biggest piece of advice to parents on how to navigate this current situation that we're in? Give us some inspiration. <laughs> Um, I would say, um, uh, hold that, hold that optimism. You've just heard a whole bunch of experts that have optimism. Uh, and so if you're feeling jittery yourself, 
uh, know that there are people that have been looking at this quite intensely and trust, trust your spidey senses that this is um, a time of adventure and it's going to be iterative and we're going to learn and adjust as we go. And all of us are on that same path. So there's a lot of camaraderie that again, if we just stay, uh, if we stay kind to ourselves and others, we're going to figure out this puzzle. Yeah, I, I, I will pick up on your be kind. I think be kind for sure. Be kind to yourself, be kind to your kids, be kind to your teachers, be kind to your schools. Um, trust that people are making good decisions. They're doing the best job they can. Know that you have choice. So uh, that's one of the huge advantages of our education system today. Know, know that you have choice and that the decision you make for September the 8th or the 10th or the 14th or whatever the first day back for your child is, doesn't have to be the same decision that you make on November the 8th or the 10th or the 14th. There's lots of flexibility and lots of choice out there. Don't be afraid to ask, ask your principals, ask your teachers. Uh, don't be afraid to talk to your kids about what they want to do. So communicate, don't be afraid, lots of choice. Right. I think my piece of advice would be to as for the adults, the parents and the educators, to be human and talk it through with the youth that are around you. We often underestimate them. We also like to appear perfect. And we they don't necessarily learn from that all the time. They can learn from us messing up or being human or you know, telling them we don't know the answer, but we're gonna look into it or those types of things. So I think there's a really big life learning opportunity right now that uh, they can benefit from and it takes some of the pressure off of ourselves. So you don't have to be perfect um, Just keep that relationship at the center and the rest of it. I think will follow. Yeah, that's great advice Great advice and to keep in mind what I've learned from all of this is that we're all in this together and we have to communicate with our children teachers officials because this is gonna be the new way of learning this is the new norm and there's nothing wrong with resetting the button, as I say, on education, because one size doesn't fit all. And this was an amazing, an amazing dis discussion that we've had here. And I know that you've eased a lot of minds, ladies, and thank you so much.